So thanks everybody for joining us for part two of our series, Saving Interior Fraser Steelhead. We're joined by uh, an amazing panel of presenters once again, and I'd like to thank them for joining us and giving us some time out of their day. This episode in particular is on hatchery propagation for conservation of interior Fraser steelhead. So I'd like to remind you that, like always, the BC Wildlife Federation is a huge supporter of science and evidence-based decision-making. So please keep your questions and comments on topic and relevant to the presentation. So with that, I will turn this over to our team. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to get my sharing going here. And it should pop up in just a moment. There we go. Oh, and I think I've got you on the inverted. Pardon me, give me one more moment. It always works in the test run and then never quite in the second follow-up. Looks great. There we go, beautiful. I can't have you seeing the notes, that's where the magic is. All right, uh, so thanks for the introduction, Steve. Um, as you mentioned today, we're gonna be uh, following up on our first webinar that we presented on Tuesday of this week. Um, in that first webinar, we discussed our findings from a literature review. I won't go too much into it as we'll discuss it in the first few slides. Uh, but the focus of today is shifting away from that literature review and taking what we learned and uh, translating that into a modeling approach. So today, what we're gonna be talking about is our work towards evaluating a hatchery program, uh, specifically a conservation program for interior Fraser River steelhead, specifically looking at modeling the risks of reduced fitness that can occur because of hatchery supplementation, um, as well as taking into account uh, small to adult survival rates. So there's a large number of us here, um, but mostly Murdoch and I are going to be presenting today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Murdoch. I'll take it away for the intro. <clears throat> Thanks, Aaron. Um, uh, good, e good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to cover a bit of a recap uh, from our Tuesday evening session uh, where we spoke about uh, what we found in the literature review and review of uh, experience in BC and elsewhere. And uh, just first of all, reiterating what we learned, what, what, what could be learned from um, the uh, implementation of the hatchery in the Thompson system from 1979 to 95. Um, uh, that was uh, quite a, a big production in terms of uh, fry and par released, like 50,000 par released for several years, and then 200,000 to up to half a million fry uh, released into streams, during streams in the Thompson drainage. And uh, But what was found was that the uh, return rates were really low. Uh, so even wild par, that's quite low. It's like seven in a thousand uh, wild par released will return as adults into the Thompson that was back then. Uh, whereas with the hatchery, it was uh, a fair bit less. Uh, so instead of seven, it was like three in a thousand coming back. Uh, that was hatchery par, but hatchery fry, that was only one in a thousand. So really low rates of return. And so that despite the hundreds of thousands of fry released, uh, they're only getting back 200 to 500 hatchery adults per year. And that was, uh, you know, with the, you know, I guess thousand to almost 8,000 total returns coming back, that was just 10 to 20% uh, contributed by hatchery. And so with that experience, uh, the province concluded uh, steel hatchery production was unsuccessful. And uh, in, in the last decade, uh, there have been some uh, reviews of that within the ministry. And they've concluded that uh, uh, they're really uh, against the use of uh, conservation hatcheries for steelhead. Um, and uh, it seems, yeah, there's, there's a very strong reluctance and uh, the policy is against it. The, the, the policy is to, to keep uh, let's say where there is hatchery production, uh, let's say for recreational purposes, to keep keep those uh, streams separate from uh, uh, ones in which there's wild production. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, so uh, there's still some uh, interest in reconsidering hatchery operations. So why, despite these really low returns? Uh, well, uh, it wasn't a total disaster. Like it, it does appear that uh, uh, the more hatchery adults they they uh, we're getting back, uh, the more it contributed to the total returns. It just wasn't a, a very big contribution. Um, and uh, so those sort of, those results in terms of uh, increasing total returns with increasing hatchery output, uh, uh, it uh, that, uh, that basically refutes hypothesis that there was absolutely no hatchery effect. Um, and uh, uh, it uh, basically inconsistent with the hypothesis that uh, hatchery production was really damaging uh, the the wild production, and uh, 
So that abundance uh, uh, recently has dropped to incredibly low levels, you know, from thousands down to dozens of fish coming back to the Thompson and the uh, Chilcotin uh, streams. And uh, if there was fry and par release uh, from hatcheries, uh, uh, if if that was started again, uh, I think we could all agree that it would probably do even worse with the uh, uh, much lower marine survival rates. Uh, however, let's say the practice was, yeah, fry and par release, uh, yet another uh, BC hatcheries like the, the Chilliwack, it's a smolt release. And so uh, maybe there's some logistical reasons why they wouldn't consider smolt release uh, in, a, in a Thompson hatchery, but it, uh, that could perhaps see uh, better outcomes. Next slide, please. And if we look elsewhere, like in the States, there's been a, a lot more experience uh, with uh, hatchery production for conservation purposes uh, than in British Columbia. And uh, it's uh, both for steelhead and Pacific salmon um, and, uh, you know, throughout the upper Columbia and Washington and, uh, you know, so very extensive experience, uh, a lot more review. And um, so what have they seen? Well, they've seen actually mild levels of improvement in wild populations with uh, conservation hatchery implementation. They've seen recolonization of tri tributaries where populations previously had gone extinct. Uh, and that's recolonization with hatchery strain fish like coho and Chinook salmon. Um, I, I, I guess I'd have to ask uh, my co-authors if they can, if there were some instances of recolonization with steelhead. Um, and uh, where there have been uh, long-term studies uh, that have been really careful and uh, looking at, um, say, not just uh, the hatchery production factor, but also all other factors known to impact hatchery production, uh, such as this paper by Quarter and a Canadian Journal, a couple of papers, um, they found that there was no negative impact of hatchery production on uh, St. Patrick wild steelhead recruitment. And uh, in fact, they found a positive association between wild steelhead recruitment and hatchery releases. So that the more that they released with in terms of wild, uh, in terms of hatchery release, uh, hatchery steelhead, uh, the higher the higher the returns of 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 wild st steelhead. So there's a hypothesis there are a potential of like safety in numbers. Uh, maybe it's a, there's a concern about predators. Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, we we uh, did a, a fairly extensive uh, review of literature, and uh, it was really daunting. There were hundreds uh, of papers. Uh, we couldn't uh, obviously read them all, but uh, we went through a lot of the different papers, uh, and uh, uh, it was really focusing on on the many different types of risks, like ecological, fishery, genetic outcomes, unintended outcomes for wild populations, hatchery intervention, and and of course. Uh, 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 these these uh, do remain a credible risk for interior Fraser steelhead, um, uh, and, and so it's it, with not a lot of data, it's really hard to really accurately assess those risks. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, there's long term experience, and much literature does suggest a number of different things. Like there are numerous modifications to operations that can mitigate those risks of unintended outcomes, and. Uh, that literature suggests, a lot of it suggests a careful weighing of potential risks in, against potential benefits. And there are some substantial, uh, substantial potential benefits in terms of prevention of extinction and um, maintaining, uh, uh, let's say, uh, unusual uh, gen genotypes and so on. And uh, uh, that literature suggests also a variety of approaches to evaluate hatchery performance and risks of hatchery operation. And uh, overall, it suggests uh, uh, like in many different situations where there's been careful evaluation, mild improvement in uh, conservation status of associated wild salmon salmon populations. That's been quite common uh, where there's been evaluation. And uh, so uh, we're going to be focusing on on uh, modeling. And uh, so uh, in the literature as well, there's uh, there are some analytical models that have been developed and applied both in the U.S. and B.C., uh, specifically for evaluating potential risks um, and long-term outcomes of hatchery operation. Um, and that's accounting for genetic risks of, of hatchery operations, among other things. So I'll put it over to Marin. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to pitch, that was a pretty, as you could probably tell, a pretty superficial review of uh, the literature. Um, so if you do want to read more, the bulk of the report that we've produced is that literature review. Um, and I'll also post uh, the title of the report again at the end. So don't feel like you have to jot it down right now. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, as Murdoch alluded to, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, what we're going to be talking about today is using some of these quantitative models that take into account genetic risks of hatchery supplementation to assess some potential steelhead conservation hatcheries that might be plausibly implemented in the interior Fraser River system. So as we mentioned in the introduction, um, and especially if you want to hear more about this, please do watch the recording of our first webinar. Uh, but over the past few decades, the population abundance of spawning interior Fraser River steelhead has declined relatively quickly, relatively drastically, down from thousands of spawning adults down to dozens. And as a result, this is really driving a lot of the conversation about whether a hatchery program could be implemented as a means of conserving this population and its genetics. So why are we talking about models? Uh, the reason that we're talking about modeling approach, specifically a simulation modeling approach, is that we can use models to ask the types of what-if questions that are either politically impractical, ecologically impossible, or otherwise difficult to answer experimentally. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of examples of the types of questions you can ask with a modeling framework. The first one being that if a conservation hatchery were to be implemented, under which conditions could the program feasibly improve the population abundance of wild steelhead and by how much? And conversely, knowing that there are genetic risks and potentially long-term effects of the hatchery program, under what conditions could the program actually cause a negative outcome for the population? So how would the system have to work for the hatchery to actually be an additional stressor for the population? So to get at these questions, uh, we used a pre-existing model called the All-H Analyzer. Some of you might be familiar with this model. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the AHA model. So this was first published in 2009 by the Hatchery Science Review Group based out of Washington. And the purpose of the model is to assess the long-term outcomes of four different H anthropogenic stressors. So these are hatchery programs, harvest systems, hydro systems like dams and weirs, uh, other diversions, uh, and finally habitat considerations. Uh, but given that we're focusing primarily on the hatchery topic, uh, we're only really going to be discussing the issues related to hatchery propagations, specifically genetic issues, um, and slightly talking about harvest, but mostly in terms of a selective harvest on hatchery fish. So while this model has been out for 15 years now, um, to date, we have not found any application of AHA to BC steelhead hatchery programs. If you know of some, we would love to hear about it. Uh, but in our experience, the AHA model has mostly been used to evaluate existing programs, so not the type of assessment of plausible programs that we're doing here. Um, specifically, the model has been used to set specific targets for the hatchery program with the goal of minimizing genetic risks uh, to wild populations. So just a couple of examples. Uh, the AHA model has been applied to steelhead populations in Washington. So in 2022, WDFW assessed 15 steelhead hatchery programs along the coast, and they specifically used the model to assess whether these programs were meeting policy targets that have been published. Uh, from this, they found that most hatchery programs on the Washington coast exceeded genetic thresholds. So what that means is that there is more hatchery genetics getting into the wild population than is set out in the management uh, guidelines. And so with this information, the team then uh, in made suggestions about levels of interbreeding and production that might be changed to meet these targets. Moving more locally, the AHA model has been applied in British Columbia, but we have only found applications to uh, Chinook salmon that have been published, considering anadromous species. Uh, so in 2018, uh, one example of the application of the model was a study done by Ruth Whitler and her team as part of a DFO report. And this team identified five different designations for Chinook salmon population based on different targets for genetic introgression. So very briefly, um, as you can see in the table, there are two major categories. One is a wild type population. So these are populations where there is no hatchery. The only genetic input from hatchery systems are if strays enter the system. So there's no dedicated brood stock, anything like that. Uh, the other category are integrated systems where there is a deliberate hatchery program, and in most cases there are targets for interbreeding between hatchery and wild fish 
So I mentioned this word quickly, uh, this term introgression. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that term means, it just means when hatchery fish are breeding back into the genetic, into the, the wild gene pool. And the reason that we care about the level of interbreeding is because if hatchery fish do indeed undergo uh, domestication selection, I'll go more into detail in a minute, but if they do in fact have less fitness, if they are breeding in a high rate back into the wild population, that poor fitness could tr be transferred into the natural wild fish. And therefore there could be actually issues with long-term fitness consequences if the level of interbreeding is too high. So when we're talking about introgression, we often use these three metrics that begin with P. I've got them highlighted in this table, P Haas, P Knob, and PNI. I'm just going to take a quick minute to talk about those. Um, the reason is that these are the targets that hatchery systems often have to try to meet. So these are the guidelines. So PHOS and PNOB are both metrics that uh, reflect the amount of interbreeding in either the hatchery or in the wild. So PHOS is the proportion of hatchery origin spawners in the wild. So for our modeling, uh, we assumed that hatchery fish are going to be allowed to spawn in the wild at some extent. And so as a result, there's going to be some hatchery adults which are breeding in nature, potentially with wild fish and producing offspring that are going to be reared in the wild. Uh, conversely, our other P metric here is P knob. This is the proportion of natural origin broodstock in the hatchery. And that's just the ratio of wild versus hatchery fish that you use for the hatchery program. Uh, if you are a visual person like me, I just want to provide a really tangible example here. Uh, so this is obviously a very sad spawning population of only five fish, but with our blue wild fish and our orange hatchery fish in this really simple example, trivial example, we would have a PHOS of two over five or 0.4. Whereas if we have a conservation hatchery where we're looking to try to conserve and propagate wild genetics, we would probably have a PNOB of 100% wild fish. This is an even more trivial example. Okay, so the reason I'm diving into these two is because there is a composite metric called PNI that is often used as a sort of large scale approximation of long-term fitness consequences of the hatchery program. Uh, so don't worry too much about the equation. It's the only one I'm gonna show, but what you really need to know is that PNI stands for the proportionate natural influence. And a PNI value uh, can range from zero to 100%, where 100% means it's a totally wild population and 0% would be a totally hatchery population. So why am I talking about PNI? Well, PNI is often used as a target for hatchery programs. And so given that we are not aware of any kind of targets that have been set for steelhead conservation hatcheries in the province, especially because as Murdoch mentioned, maybe they're not exactly planning for this to be a system that they're implementing. Um, we made the assumption that with Larry et al's uh, integrated wild type population would be appropriate. And the reason for this is because it is an intentional hatchery program with 100% wild brood stock. So it fits into that category. And if we were to say, this is what the hatchery program could aim for, we would expect a PNI target to be greater than 80%. Okay, so enough case studies, let's talk about the model. Um, so I alluded to the fact that the AHA model, the key feature that we're interested in using for this analysis is the uh, issues related to genetic risk, um, fitness, and domestication selection. So I'm now just going to give a little bit of context about how the model does that in broad terms. So at the core of the AHA model is that we assume there is some heritable trait that has consequences for fish survival. So a tangible example for a hatchery system might be the boldness of a fish, where a fish might be more or less shy or bold, and this could have impacts on their survival. So in the wild environment, in this natural rearing stream, uh, over time, natural selection is going to cause the population's average boldness to be at a place which is more or less beneficial for their survival in that environment. So this is sort of an important thing to bear in mind is that a fish that's raised in the wild is gonna be good at surviving in the wild, hopefully as a result of natural selection as well as other factors. But once we introduce a hatchery, uh, we introduce an alternative environment, a different environment that might have different selective pressures. And this is where we start to see the risk of domestication selection coming into place. 
So if hatchery fish survive better in the hatchery, if they are more bold, if they're able to get food, for example, more quickly than their peers, uh, domestication selection might cause the uh, trait in the hatchery population to move away from the trait that would be optimal in the wild. So over time, if the hatchery population and the wild population are interbreeding, if there's any amount of introgression in the system, what we have is a tug of war between the natural selective pressure in the wild and the domestication selection pressure in the hatchery. And the more hatchery influence over the genome in the wild population, the more hatchery-like traits we're expecting to see even for fish that breed and rear in the wild. And so keeping with this example of boldness, the reason why we care about this trait is because the trait may not be useful in all environments. So for example, if we have our very bold hatchery fish here on the left versus our relatively timid stream reared fish on the right, if the hatchery causes domestication selection that leads to increased boldness, this could be by altering the gene sequence or gene expression. And if the genetic cause of that trait change is passed from a hatchery fish to wild spawned offspring, what we could see is wild rearing fish that inherit this sort of poor boldness trait that was really good in the hatchery, but not good in the wild, uh, their early life survival is lowered. So essentially how this model deals with domestication selection is that if a wild fish has domestic traits, their early life survival is quite low compared to a fish that say has the natural selected trait. Okay, so how do traits actually get passed on? Uh, this is a function of that introgression that I focused so much on at the beginning. So as I mentioned, there are two places where interbreeding can happen between hatchery and uh, wild fish. So one of these is in the wild. And just to let you know a couple of details about the model. Um, in the model, we assume that if a hatchery reared fish uh, survives their return journey back to the, the stream, um, and if they then go on to spawn in the wild, uh, in the model, we have it set that hatchery reared fish have less than half of the reproductive success of wild fish. And this rate was taken from the literature. And these uh, differences in relative reproductive success can be attributed to things like differences in behavior or site selection, or even things like epigenetic changes. Uh, switching now to breeding within the brood stock, uh, following BC's steelhead stream classification policy, we assume that a conservation hatchery would have only wild fish as the brood stock because those are the genetics that we're trying to preserve. Uh, just a few final details to round it off and get us back to the point where we have adults <laughs> returning to spawn. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slides, uh, lower fitness as a result of domestication selection causes poor early life survival for those um, offspring of hatchery fish that are reared in the wild. It's a bit complicated. Um, and I'll just mention that I'm not going to talk too much about the rearing in the wild part of our model, but it's a fairly standard um, density dependent model that was parameterized based off of observed data from the system. So once the fish have reared and smolted uh, within the model, we also assume that the return rate of hatchery smolts is half that of their wild uh, peers. And again, this number is based off of previous observations, but I'll just mention uh, now you'll see in later results that we actually uh, ran multiple models with more extreme differences between the hatchery and wild fish uh, performance. Uh, the final thing that I'll mention about the model is that once uh, hatchery released smolts uh, are released into the river system, they go immediately to sea. So the model at this point doesn't have any kind of impact on hatchery released smolts on wild juveniles that might be in the system. And part of this is because we're assuming that a hatchery is rearing fish until the smolt stage. So they're ready to go. All right. So that's enough detail about how the model works. What did we actually do with it? So we sought to answer two questions with this modeling framework. Uh, the first one being how well do different types of hatchery programs perform considering two different uh, potentially opposing measures. Uh, one being just simply what do we expect the wild fish abundance to look like after hatchery supplementation? And second, what do we expect PNI that long-term fitness indicator, what do we expect that to look like? 
Uh, so the second question that we then sought to answer with the model is we then sought to identify what we call boundaries. So these are essentially um, the edges of where the hatchery can actually have any kind of positive. So, so we were tweaking the model inputs to figure out under what conditions do the hatcheries actually cause a negative impact on wild population abundance. So for answering this first question, um, we chose to model three alternative hatchery scenarios. Uh, these are just to get started. Um, so the, in the first case, we simulated a no hatchery scenario. So this is essentially saying, what does the model expect to happen if uh, in the initial year, we just set everything up to mimic reality, what has been seen in recent years with the population? What happens if we just proceed as usual without a hatchery program? The second scenario that we modeled was a minimal hatchery program where we take in 10 wild fish to the brood stock up to a maximum of 10% of the natural origin return population. So this isn't a, a large brood stock. Um, and the third scenario was uh, almost exactly the same as scenario two, where it's a minimal hatchery, only in this case, we also introduced a selective harvest rate on 60% of the hatchery adult returns. Um, this is considered, uh, you know, an expert opinion from Rob Bison. He says 60% is probably about the maximum that could be removed from a mark selective hatchery fishery. Uh, I'll just mention right up the front, um, we did parameterize these scenarios, uh, but obviously these are not exhaustive and these are definitely not recommendations. So currently there have been no proposed hatchery programs for this population. We didn't have like a set case to work off of. So instead we are treating these as sort of what if scenarios to get the ball rolling on thinking about this kind of modeling. So let's just take a minute to compare these three hatchery alternatives according to both abundance and long-term fitness. Uh, so first let's talk about how we expect the uh, abundance of the natural spawning adult fish to change over the first 10 generations of hatchery supplementation. And I'll just mention um, our definition of a wild fish in this case, it does vary by model, but in this case, we are considering the offspring of any fish that spawns in the wild to be a wild fish. So if your eggs were, if you were hatched from an egg that was uh, deposited in the wild, you are a wild fish. So the model currently doesn't have the ability to keep track of for example, if you're the first generation offspring of hatchery released parents. Okay, so just with that caveat, know what we mean by a wild fish. So let's take a look at these results. So first let's take a look at our status quo, no hatchery case here in the bottom in blue. Uh, what the model expects is that from the starting population abundance, which is reflective of uh, recent years, the model predicts that the population abundance is likely, if left uh, unaffected by the hatchery program, it's likely to decrease slightly over time and stabilize at uh, just below 200 spawners per year. Conversely, the model predicted that the highest wild uh, fish abundance would be realized under a hatchery program that does not have a selective harvest. And the reason for this is just because those fish are able to spawn and produce wild offspring. But the key and I of you will take a look at that y-axis and recognize that we're still talking about hundreds of fish here, um, not like the thousands that we were seeing historically. So even if a hatchery program were introduced, wild fish abundance is still below historical levels. So it really matters what your actual goals are in terms of natural origin abundance uh, to know whether or not this hatchery is going to be what you want. <clears throat> okay, let's switch now to uh, sort of the flip side of this is, yes, we might have increased abundance, but what about fitness, right? What about this big issue that we're thinking about with genetic risks? Uh, so here we're going to look at the results of this PNI metric under those three scenarios. Um, and just a reminder that under this metric, a value of one indicates a totally wild population. And so here, uh, what we see, I think, is quite intuitive. So if we don't have a hatchery program, the PNI remains one. Makes sense. There isn't a hatchery program. Uh, then looking at the two other cases, what we see is that uh, a minimal hatchery, uh, regardless of whether there's a selective harvest, obviously lowers the long-term fitness outcomes. But if we have a selective harvest on hatchery returns, 
uh, there are fewer hatch respawners and therefore less long-term fitness loss expected from the population. But if you recall from the work of Ruth Whitler uh, and that Chinook salmon PNI target table I showed you earlier, the AHA model predicts that our PNI target or our, our PNI outcome is going to be below that 80% metric that was used in Chinook. So remembering that's for Chinook, it may not apply for steelhead. And so it may be the case that if this model is predicting appropriately, it may be the case that without a selective uh, harvest, even a relatively small hatchery program is going to be below our target for uh, genetic integrity. So as I mentioned, uh, these are relatively restrictive hatchery programs. So 10 fish for broodstock is not huge. So we also use the model to try to assess more extreme hatchery programs. Uh, and I just want to take a minute to say that I think this is why I like models is that while we recognize they have limits, you can use them to assess these types of dependencies on what matters in the system and, and what happens if we make things quite extreme. Uh, so here, I'm just going to take a minute to orient you to how the next set of figures are going to look. They're a little bit different than what you might have seen before. But essentially, what this is going to be is now, instead of a time series plot, we're looking at um, what's called an isopleth. It's like a square with different colors you'll see in a minute. Um, but the key thing here is that in this square, we are um, looking at different hatchery program rules on each of the x and the y axis. So uh, from on, on basically from top to bottom, we are looking at what are the long-term outcomes when we uh, increase the hatchery broodstock from zero fish down here at the bottom up to a maximum of 100 fish for each year. That's a pretty extreme. And just a reminder that all of these broodstock are wild fish. And looking at the x-axis, again, we've got our um, Oh, pardon me. I look at the x-axis. Uh, our other rule that we're modifying is the maximum percent of the wild population to take for broodstock. So you may remember in those base cases, we were taking a maximum of 10% of the wild returns maximum. And here we're saying, what if we loosen that restriction and take up to 100% of the returns? So as we move from the bottom left corner up to the top right, uh, what we are moving from is a no hatchery scenario to a maximum hatchery scenario. And within the square, uh, I mentioned that there's going to be colors involved. Uh, the color represents the number of adult wild fish after 100 generations of the hatchery program, with uh, areas in light yellow uh, being few fish around the order of 200 and darker red being more fish around 600. Again, this is just wild fish abundance. Okay, so this is just a preview of what you're going to look at. Let's go ahead and dive in. And thank you for bearing with me. All right, so the results of this analysis um, is just to sort of guide you here. Our two base case scenarios are down here in the bottom left corner, just to show you that in terms of the full range of the hatchery production that we simulated, our two base cases are relatively minimal. Uh, and what we see here is that even under the maximum hatchery production that we simulated with the AHA model, the outcome after 100 generations of propagation is still less than 700 adults per year. Uh, so again, we're still not able to recreate that high abundance that was seen in the past. So that's uh, that's just sort of the set of results from the first question that we sought to answer with the model. But now let's switch and say, okay, that's enough optimism. Let's identify the conditions that result in really pessimistic outcomes. So let's, again, manipulate the inputs to the model to figure out under what conditions we might actually be introducing a new stressor. So to provide an example of the type of pessimistic case that I'm talking about here, um, in our baseline results that I showed previously, we simulated hatchery fish having half of the return rate of wild fish. But in this pessimistic, pessimistic case, we thought, what if we crank that down such that hatchery fish have a much, much lower return rate than wild? So what if instead of one half, what if instead we're looking at one fifteenth? What would we see? So the first thing I'll mention is that we see overall far fewer fish. Um, coming into the system. So you'll notice that in our color scale here, now our light yellow isn't talking about a couple hundred fish, we're talking about less than 10. 
and our dark red is now just over 160 fish. So overall, much lower returns. But specifically, what we found with this sort of uh, sensitivity test is that if hatchery fish have very low marine survival, very low return rate, high residualization, what we would expect is the removal of wild fish for brood stock could actually have exclusively a negative effect on the wild population. So you notice nowhere in these color graphs do we see a case better than the zero. So if it's the case that hatchery fish cannot survive or spawn effectively in the wild, our best hatchery might actually be no hatchery to conserve the species. But bear in mind, this is on relatively, this is based off of um, really, really poor hatchery fish performance. So we took a look at these results and we thought, okay, um, what if the, if the hatchery program is only able to provide a maximum of a few hundred fish on top of baseline conditions, uh, what is it that's holding the population back? And uh, for that, we took our model and we started to explore what happens if we change the return rate of the wild fish population. <clears throat> So here, just to let you know, we're returning to our baseline settings where hatchery fish have half of the return rate of wild. We're not in that 1 15th case that I just showed you. And in this case, we ran simulations where we simulated those three base case hatcheries, status quo, hatchery, and hatchery with selective harvest. And we reran the model under different assumptions of smolt adult return rate, both increasing and decreasing relative to the number that's been observed in recent years. And so what we find is uh, it really matters. So regardless of the hatchery program, the AHA model suggested that low return rate does seem to be a bottleneck currently to wild fish abundance. And regardless of what hatchery program were to be implemented, we simply can't get to abundances in the thousands um, you know, with just a hatchery, right? There, there's more going on. OK. Um, I'm gonna leave the results there and basically take a step back. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Feel free to ask follow-up questions on those results, but I'm just gonna take a moment to summarize some of the key takeaways. So the first major conclusion that I came off of this was uh, the hatchery influence on wild fish, specifically thinking about genetic and fitness consequences of domestication. This influence really depends on how well hatchery fish perform in the wild in terms of both reproductive success and marine survival. So under our baseline model settings, we found that the conservation hatchery program may improve wild fish abundance up to three times that of the status quo. However, uh, if hatchery fish have very poor post-release survival or reproductive success, or if they otherwise aren't effectively uh, able to replace wild fish, Taking brood stock may, in fact, have a negative, uh, negative effect on wild population size by removing those potential spawners. Overall, as well, we found that the model projected that population abundance is very much limited by recent very poor marine survival. Uh, unfortunately for us as modelers, um, it is very hard to estimate return rates in general. And it is also very hard to estimate the relative difference between wild fish return rates and hatchery fish return rates. So this is not only an influential part of our model, it's also a difficult to estimate part of our model. So just to wrap up and contrast some of our modeling results to the real world experience that Murdoch introduced at the beginning. Uh, overall, the literature does suggest that conservation hatcheries, and I wanna put an emphasis on conservation hatcheries, not production hatcheries, uh, these often have neutral to mildly positive impacts on wild fish abundance, but it very much depends on how the program is run. Uh, interestingly, we found that our AHA models results were not highly different from the Thompson production experience. So in our analysis of historical stocking, or not ours, sorry, uh, an analysis of historical stocking found that the hatchery supplementation could increase the abundance of wild fish, uh, but only by a few hundred adults each year, which is within the magnitude that the AHA model predicts. Uh, interestingly, though, as Murdoch mentioned, this historical stocking occurred under both more optimistic marine survival and that hatchery program released both fry and par. So it may be the case that because the AHA model simulated smolt releases, uh, 
they have higher survival rates built into that model because they're larger, uh, further along in their development. Um, so it may be the case that if we were to reparameterize the AHA model to instead reflect the release of FRI or PAR, uh, the model projections could be far worse. So certainly the model might be tweaked uh, yeah, in these ways to try to represent different potential uh, hatchery scenarios. So if we're not interested in releasing smolts, we can try to reparameterize it. Um, and I'm sure that anyone in here who is familiar with modeling will not be surprised to hear me now list some limitations of this approach. Uh, so the AHA model, of course, comes with many, many assumptions. It's a really parameter heavy model. Um, and for those of you listening, you probably thought that seems a really simple way to represent genetics. And very much so, this model does have to simplify a lot of the real world stuff that's going on. So for example, the model ignores epigenetic transmission of gene expression. Uh, it doesn't account for sexual selection in the wild, and it doesn't account for sex-specific reproductive success as been, has been observed. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, we don't know what the hatchery management policies might look like. So instead, we had to make some educated guesses about things like selective harvest rates, broodstock rules, and genetic targets. And it may be that these assumptions don't hold up. Um, additionally, one overarching issue with the model is that our simulations don't account for potential contribution from resident rainbow trout populations. So uh, I'll let Eric talk more about it if you'd like to, but there is uh, evidence that these populations, you know, a resident can produce an anadromous offspring and vice versa. Um, but it's not very well understood. It's a major source of uncertainty in our model, what that residualization might look like. But in addition to relative uh, marine survival rates of hatchery versus wild reared fish, certainly that contribution of rainbow trout is uh, a major unknown. All right, with that, I will just plug again, we have produced this report. If you wanna read 145 pages, please go ahead. There's a ton of detail in there. Uh, but if you don't feel like reading, you can always ask us. But before I open it up for questions, I just wanna acknowledge that uh, this has been a pretty major project with a lot of support. Obviously, thank you to BC Wildlife Foundation and MyTax for funding. Uh, Jesse Zeman, unfortunately, wasn't here, but he was a great help during our project implementation. Uh, and I also want to just add a lot of people were involved in reviewing this work, uh, reviewing the grant application, and there's been a lot of minds involved on this. So uh, with that, I just want to open it up for questions and discussion. Um, and I also want to give the opportunity for folks who might have feedback on the model. Uh, please, we're happy to hear it. Thanks. Awesome. And as expected, we do have some questions in the chat here. So I will start and forgive me if I butcher your name, but Poole Beck. Did you model gene flow and or smolt production from a very significant resident population? Mm. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mentioned at the end, but we actually don't account for uh, the resident population in the model. Part of the reason for that is that the AHA model is uh, originally parameterized for completely anadromous somonids. So um, this is something that we're actively thinking about how to develop into the model, but we assume that every fish that we model is an anadromous fish. We, we don't include in the model any kind of uh, residency. Excellent. Hope that answered the question. Uh, I know, not a great satisfying <laughs> answer. It's like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> made, made, yeah. made sense to me. <laughs> uh, Brian Hebden's got a couple here, so I'll do, there's there's a two-part one here. Great. So the Thompson steelhead are already, quote, contaminated with hatchery-produced steelhead from previous years of hatchery production. So isn't this analysis a moot point for the Thompson? So great question. Oh, do you want to do the second part? Steve, sorry. Uh, no, I think uh, it, it'll be able to stand alone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, so that's a great point. Um, we do model the population as though it starts off as wild fish being perfectly fit. So that is something that we can turn off in the model, but you have to have a, you know, a kind of quantitative guess of what a reasonable number might be for that original issue. Because I hear you like, yes, these fish are not 
perfectly fit. They haven't undergone, you know, millennia of evolution without a hatchery. Um, I will say that there have been several generations over which natural selection might be filtering some of those negative hatchery traits. So uh, I'm not that much of a genetics expert. I don't know for sure, but I would love to see research looking into whether there is a lasting genetic signal, but I don't know if that'd even be possible, honestly. But yeah, it, it's something that we could incorporate in the model as well, is that if we start our population as being less fit than optimal and then at a hatchery, what would happen? And in this case, what we would likely see is yes, the fitness outcomes are worse. The abundance of the returns is going to be slightly lower. Um, but unless they are quite, quite not fit at the beginning, I do believe that we would, uh, it would be unlikely to have a, a highly negative result, but uh, we can run the model on that maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious on the part two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's the point of producing more fish if the problem of low and diminished returns are is not addressed? That's a great question. I'm going to take a first stab at it and then I'll open it up to uh, my collaborators here. But um, there are lots of reasons that we might want to have more fish. Um, it may be that we simply want greater angling opportunities or food, or in this case, like a conservation hatchery is very much about trying to preserve the genetics that exist now. So it's almost like a, a stopgap to be like, okay, things are bad. Maybe we can keep it going for a little while. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to others if they want to jump in. So just a couple of points on the stuff that you, question that you just asked. The um, domestication issue, uh, the selection for domestics takes place pr pretty quickly. And so what we're anticipating is the supply selection against domestics will take place equally quickly when they're in the wild. Uh, so yeah, I think that the generation since the uh, hatchery uh, program stopped has probably eliminated any selection that was uh, in place now. Um, the In terms of the um, why you would want to produce these, uh, it's partly a value question. So, and it's partly a an ecological question. So the value uh, in the Thompson Steelhead, the societal value, people like these great big fish that come back, okay? The ecological side of things is that uh, right now, what we believe is happening is that there's heavy selection against going to the ocean because the ocean survival is so low. Uh, in effect, what you're trying to do with a hatchery is you're trying to um, balance that selection against going to the ocean with selection for going to the ocean by intentionally st choosing steelhead parents and uh, releasing them running the hatchery program in such a way that they will go to the ocean. So um, the interaction between the uh, residents and the, um, while we're not modeling them, um, that's the sort of fundamentals of the um, reason why you would want to be running a conservation hatchery in this situation. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, Thompson Steel had the genetic pool is not going to go extinct because of the residents, mm -hmm. uh, but the you're going to be losing that component of the genetic pool and it will have to be reestablished, you know, whenever the marine survival improves again, if and when it does. So I think that's sort of answering the question, Steve, maybe you... Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Anybody else want to cont continue on that one or should I move on to the next one? Next one. Perfect. Go ahead, the next okay. one. I also, okay. I'll start here. <laughs> All good. Bool's got a question again. 
Uh, was it considered that the Thompson is made up of several smaller spawning tributary populations? Mm. No, we, we couldn't account for that spatial structure uh, at this point. Um, essentially, what you would have to end up doing is having a certain um, model configuration for each subpopulation, trying to assess what proportion of hatchery fish goes to each tributary, right? Because it may be the case that hatchery fish don't actually migrate that far upriver. So, okay, maybe you have a different hatchery contribution near the ocean rather than further upstream. Um, it's just a level of complexity that we didn't have the option to include, unfortunately. It would be great if we did. Eric, does that data even exist for hatchery um, distribution? I don't know. I mean, we recognize that the Thompson has got a structure. So with the three main stocks, uh, populations of Bonaparte, Dead Man, and the Nicola, and then as well, you even have some, some substructure within that. So you have Spires Creek and the cold water, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> the objective of the hatchery modeling is to really help understand uh, sort of what if situations, what if we did this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to attempt to, if if there is a, um, uh, if you want to ask questions about how important uh, is the population structuring to the maintenance of the overall sort of the meta population structure in the maintenance of the overall Thompson run. Um, that's a different model. You, you, you can build it, but it's a different model. What were, what you would essentially, I mean, you can anticipate what's going to happen though, because essentially as a population gets under more and more stress, it retreats into the best habitat. Mm. So yeah, you may lose some of those outlying ones if their habitat isn't as good as the um, uh, as the overall average. You'll notice in those slides, can you, Marin, put up the slide where the things shoot off at an angle? <laughs> I'll do you my know, best. They, uh, pop, they, they, the oh, one where- yeah. The three abundance you, plot? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, versus marine survival, I think it was. Yeah, I'll tell you, and you you show me if it's what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, one moment, please. I closed the slide. Silly me. Okay. Uh. Uh, there we are. Nope, nope. The one where the... Oh, 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 the return rate. Yeah, yeah, pardon me. Yeah. There yes. Go. Oh, yeah. They are shooting off. Look at that. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and uh, this this sort of illustrates the big issue. Okay, is that if you think about marine survival, small to return adult return rate as along the x-axis, we're right now, given the parameters of juvenile production, we're right at the edge mm -hmm. of the steelhead stock being not viable. And that's why you get this little sectional area. You maybe you uh, over yeah, I can to, maybe highlight it a little here. Yeah, yeah. Over to the left of the dotted oh. line yeah. where, yeah, you get more viability. And that's what I was saying that you're trying to give a little bit of an edge to the a Nandrimus population to keep them going while this marine survival is on. And the reason why you have to do that is the blue line is saying marine survival drops another, you know, quarter percent. And yeah, you won't be getting, you know, steelhead will just sort of wind down to extinction. Sure. So hopefully that helps. Hey. Lots of questions are filing in. Not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. We're going to put a, a hard stop on this by 8.30. So let's try and get through as many as we can. So Ryan wants to know, is there a statistical model underlying the AHA model? Mm. Uh, it's too bad I can't ask a follow-up question. Um, there is not an explicit data fitting procedure, if that's what you're getting at. So you don't input raw data. It won't tell you, okay, here's what the different parameters are for the model. 
uh, you need to come into the model with that information in hand. Um, that said, to parameterize the model, we did ensure that while it was running, it was able to recreate um, recent conditions, but obviously you know, there's limits to that. But no, the model does not uh, in its original form include any type of statistical model fitting. I hope that was the question being asked. If not, I'm sorry, <laughs> feel free to follow up. <laughs> and second part of that one is how impactful is habitat loss to the decline of IFS? Mm. Um, uh, yeah, in the model, we don't assess that. Eric, do you want to talk ecologically? <laughs> yeah, it's really not part of this uh, discussion, but um, uh, as I understand it, and I've been out of this for a bit, you probably have to ask somebody like Rob Bison much more. That's a question for him. Uh, my impression is, is that this is driven by marine survival. This is not driven by, um, you know, habitat issues at this point. And that's, you know, sort of 90% marine survival. And yes, of course, you can always have better habitat. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Rick Taylor, does the model account for the reduced population of wild fish rather than just interactions between wild and hatchery fish? Yes. So um, I assume what that question means is, do we account for the fact that fish are being removed for the brood stock? And the answer is yes. Uh, those fish are taken in. They do not spawn in the wild. Um, the abundance is reduced. Yeah. Quick and easy answer there. <laughs> Short and sweet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could have made it shorter and sweeter. I like that. Catherine, how would you define a conservation hatchery versus other type? Yeah, great question. Um, we did stress that a lot without defining it. So thank you for that. Uh, so a conservation hatchery, uh, a lot of these classifications are uh, built off of the objective of what the hatchery program is looking for. So um, my categorization that I apply would differentiate between a conservation hatchery, which seeks to be a hatchery that is targeted towards maintaining genetic integrity of wild fish, uh, which is looking to make sure that, yes, we're producing hatchery fish, but they need to contribute to the wild population. That's a conservation hatchery. Um, whereas the alternative would be something like I would call a production hatchery, where you are creating hatchery fish without the purpose of supporting a wild population. So you may be intentionally breeding that hatchery population to be differentiated from the wild. So in some cases, just to give you a tangible example, um, these hatcheries typically do not try to have interbreeding between the wild and hatchery populations. Um, sometimes there will be intentional moves to try to change, um, for example, the run timing of the hatchery and wild fish to prevent them from interbreeding. So uh, one of the key differentiators for me is, are you creating the hatchery in an attempt to preserve wild genetics, or are you trying to isolate the wild genetics from the hatchery program? So is it integrated, or are you trying to keep them separate? Uh, that's a really major differentiator. And you can think of uh, the broader conservation movement, captive breeding in general. Captain You're trying yeah. to preserve something that yeah. may be lost. Whereas for salmon in particular, uh, you have captive breeding to provide a thousand fish for somebody to go out and catch. Mm -hmm. And that's the fundamental difference. Yeah, and probably because this model deals a lot with interbreeding, I always think about interbreeding, but yeah, thanks, Eric. I'm going to try and combine a couple of questions here that are very similar from Michael Barr and Mark Rockwell. Uh, global synthesis of peer-reviewed research on the effects of hatchery salmonids on wild salmonids. Essentially, this study... Uh, collates the basic outcomes to wild, and it reports that hatchery impacts are over 70 to 80% negative. And why, per why proceed with assessing a conservation hatchery knowing this? Uh, I'll give a preliminary um, answer to this. Uh, I am familiar with the study. Um, when they looked at the hatchery programs which had positive outcomes, those were conservation hatcheries. So again, I, I do hear there is a lot of risk. Um, 
And certainly like our modeling results do show, yes, there is a fitness loss of having a hatchery program. And that paper finds, yeah, there's a fitness loss in these supplemented programs. The opposite side of that is, is that fitness loss accompanied by the type of abundance increase that we would want to see in a conservation hatchery? So my short answer of that would be um, that global synthesis does include the same types of results that our model does show. And it's very much a balancing act between your different objectives. So fitness on one hand, abundance on the other, all kinds of other metrics, of course, are important. Um, but as Eric said, we're looking at very pessimistic marine survival, small to adult return rates right now for this population. And so um, at least you know, recognizing that the modeling approach is limited and that there might be some incorrect inputs. Um, you know, it, there's a, there's a trade-off. Uh, the population is declining. Marine survival is quite poor. There might be an opportunity here. Um, and certainly, yeah, that meta-analysis does find there is a genetic impact, but the model accounts for that and it explicitly says, yes, there is that genetic impact. And we recognize that. Um, I don't know if others want to add on to that. I. I'm not as much the policy person, so I'm much more coming from the modeling side of things, but. I think you have to look at the individual situation. Uh, just give you two quick examples. Uh, the Stanley Basin sockeye. You know, you had Lonesome Charlie coming back in 1993 as the only sockeye, and he was a male. And they reconstituted that run from the kokanee that were in the lake. So there's there is that interplay again between the residents and mm -hmm. the um, and the anadromous run, and they have got anadromous fish coming back, and a lot of that has to do with a very careful fish culture program. Uh, the study we're involved in on the Willamette River, they're attempting to reintroduce. Um, uh, steelhead and uh, Chinook above dams where they've been extirpated. The only way to get those fish up there is a hatchery program, and that will be uh, a conservation hatchery program. Uh, in other words, that you're putting hatchery fish up there because there aren't a whole lot of wild fish left. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't need to go into detail, but it's restoring something that you've lost is uh, the... Uh, and at this point, there are four, so few Thompson River steelhead adults that you are in danger of losing that life history. And you can see that if on this graph that we have on the screen, marine survival goes down a little bit more. And yeah, the uh, Thompson will become like the North Thompson, which doesn't have steelhead. Thanks, Eric. Before we move on to the next couple of questions, just want to remind everybody that uh, this is a discussion about hatchery steelhead. So try and keep your questions on that thread. I've seen some come in that are great questions, but they're not really relevant to what we're dealing with. And also a reminder to keep them respectful, please. So let's move on to another one from Brian. Based on your experience now in developing this model, do you believe we have sufficient knowledge to predict outcomes, or would you recommend a more research-oriented approach using PAST to identify key parameters and apply new genome monitoring tools? Ooh. It's a good yes. one. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly... Um, I know we we did not go as into depth with uh, the state of this modeling and our competence, but yet there are, are major limitations. If this is not informed by any like real world genomic analysis yet. So yeah, we would love to see this model be more informed. Um, I think there are a lot of additional details that need to be sorted out, not just on the genetic side, but also in terms of what the hatchery program would look like. So uh, I think what this modeling in my mind really asserts is that outcomes are highly dependent on things like how well hatchery fish can succeed in the wild. And that's something that hatchery managers do have some control over um, by rearing environment changes and things like this. So yeah, there's certainly more that we could find out about the initial conditions and the ecology, but also, you know, the details of the program, hypothetically, you know, we're not saying that a hatchery program will be implemented, 
but you, these models have to be based off of actual, yeah, potential regulations and rules. Um, but we would uh, love to have full genomic work on this. Um, the more, the better. <laughs> yeah. Eric, did you want to add you were so enthusiastic? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think anything like this, which is an unknown, you approach it as an adaptive management experiment. Once mm -hmm. you decide to go ahead with the thing, then you have to have some sort of uh, monitoring program, some sort of plan of doing things, implementing actions that are yeah. going to help you learn whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. And um, again, uh, you look at some of the programs in the U.S., and there is an enormous amount of research <laughs> that, for instance, in the Willamette River that we're working on that's going into you know, how do you, uh, how do you know it's working? Mm -hmm. So you clearly you have to do that. So. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Eric. Adaptive management is really key. Yeah. Monitoring and being willing to change as issues arise yes. is huge. Let's jump over to Facebook for this question from Sheila Kerr. Has there been any research or modeling that has looked at introducing AF3N hatchery steelhead? The B triploid. Sorry, I'm not familiar with the abbreviation. I, I can probably answer that because I, I I'm the one who wrote the AF3N paper. So <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> if you were doing a production hatchery, uh, you might want to have sterile steelhead, but no, a conservation hatchery. Uh, you want the fish to reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some evidence from the hormone sterilized fish that, yeah, they're sterile. They they don't come back. Uh, they, they don't have that cue of maturation to come back. So, hmm. uh, no, AF3N would not be something that would be considered. I, I, I You have to ask the MOE guys. I'm sort of putting words in their mouth. But, uh, you know, I can't imagine them considering that so yeah hard to imagine for a conservation hatchery yeah excellent move on to one from brian morrison have you examined results from the other conservation hatcheries for steelhead to determine if they had met their objectives such as the living gene bank program on vancouver island for these populations that were on the verge of blinking out was this approach helpful mm, i haven't looked into that myself i'm not familiar with that work um the we we did try to look at the experience in bc um a lot of it is not real well documented but for instance in our tuesday talk and murdoch maybe you can chime in here we did look at the, the keel is well documented and uh we did look at that and the keel was part of the living gene bank and um, basically, the, I think the conclusion was, um, again, I don't want to put policy words in the mouths of the MOE biologists, right? But the fact that they shut it down suggests that, yeah, they evaluated and felt it wasn't working. That wasn't a policy they wanted to pursue. Can I say something? Yeah. Oh, your audio is not coming out properly, Murdoch. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Interpretive no, dance. <laughs> First word. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Drew always got a good one, I think. Even though IFS kelt return rates are low, was there contemplation of adding kelt recovery augmenting into this conservation hatchery model? Have we talked about it, Eric? Uh, yeah, there's been a bunch of work on kelt recovery, okay? And uh, like in the keel, uh, at very low population densities, kelts are a very important part of the... Um, the uh, adult run are repeat spawners. And uh, repeat spawners, there's two couple of characteristics. One of the characteristics is they tend to be female. 
So in the Willamette, it's four to one female for for repeats. And they come back up to three or four times. And they'll sustain a population when, uh, you know, marine survival is very low. Uh, there's no detailed studies on whether marine survival of uh, kelts has dropped to the extent that the marine survival of smolts have done. The other guys who've done a lot of work on, um, you know, reconditioning kelts are the uh, Yakima group, the group working on the Yakima River. Egan Cassidy has a, a multi-part one that I'll try and compress. The AHA model assumes the release of smolts. Where in the watershed are these smolts being released? Mm. Wherever likely the hatchery is going to be put, right? A lot of the times releases are either at the hatchery or they might be, depending on the objectives of the program, placed closer to the ocean. Um, but we did find in our literature review that release location does have an impact on the long-term outcomes of the program. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, some programs try to keep the populations <clears throat> isolated. Um, in our case, it's not a spatially explicit model. So we don't have it set to be in a specific spot in the river. Rather, how the model deals with this is it just goes, okay, the smolts are released and they go to sea without interacting with the wild juvenile fish. So if we were to have to convert it into a spatial place, it would be somewhere where they don't interact with juvenile fish in a serious enough way that they impact the wild fish survival. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, that's certainly something that would be uh, really useful if, you know, as a follow-up thing for any program that might be implemented, right? Where is it release is going to happen? It's quite influential for the, not only the fact that the hatchery fish, um, in some cases you want them to home back to the hatchery, but also in terms of residency patterns and, yeah, lots of factors there. Yeah, it's a good question, um, though. The location is important. Uh, in the Chilliwack, they release them down low because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get, that's a production hatchery. They're trying to get the, the hatchery fish to stay low so they'll be caught and the wild fish go through. And, and in fact, they do. Um, that was part of the reason why the hatchery program in the Thompson involved par and fry. Mm. They actually did a, an assessment prior to the hatchery program uh, that essentially told them they thought that the um, uh, that the, the, the habitat was underseeded. And so there was room to stick in fry and par. And uh, so, yeah, if you're stocking smolts, uh, what you would be doing is you would be trying to stock smolts in places where you want them to return to and reproduce. This is a conservation uh, type hatchery. So, um, yeah. Presumably, yeah. yeah. Wherever there is spawning habitat that would be leading to successful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I need to read the second part of Keegan's uh, questionnaire. I think you covered it pretty pretty well there and talking about uh, the reasons for the, the release locations. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Keegan. That was good. Uh, yeah, thanks this, this could be a, a good one here. Uh, Leonard wants <laughs> to know if, if, if you don't do a hatchery, do you have a model that shows when the IFS will be extinct? So well, you're looking at it right here. <laughs> yeah, we got this. We show some declines. Right. But yeah, as Eric says, this is it. Our blue line. This is where this is where right we're looking there. at. <laughs> That's where we're looking at extinction. That's yep. why we're down to, you know, a remnant. Is yeah, because the, the marine survival is so low that uh, a natural population the, in when marine survival goes down, freshwater survival has to go up in order for the population to maintain itself. Mm -hmm. And eventually the freshwater survival just runs out of compensation. The survival is as high as it'll go. Mm -hmm. Perfect, that that was the slide I was hoping, I was kind of thinking what you would go to. I, <laughs> you, you might've missed it, but that uh, I believe answered that perfectly.
uh, going through here. Uh, another one coming in, just back back to Sheila. Good one from Facebook. Uh, my understanding from previous slides that the increased abundance of hatchery steelhead was positively related to the return of wild steelhead. Was that based on the virility of hatchery steelhead? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Thank you. My, under my understanding from previous slides was that the increased abundance of hatchery steelhead was positively related to the return of wild steelhead. Was that based on the virility of hatchery steelhead? Yeah, uh, I hope I'm understanding correctly, um, but in none of the slides have we shown the return abundance of hatchery fish. So the only results that we've shown is for the wild population, bearing in mind that the wild population can come from hatchery parents or grandparents. Um, so the, uh, just thinking about if I've understood the question correctly, um, the, let me, maybe I can uh, explain it using this angle, but, um, it is the case that a wild fish is certainly going to have a higher, according to the model, is going to have a higher reproductive output than a hatchery fish. So that is being reflected in these um, results. But once those, you know, offspring of hatchery adults are reared in the wild, they do become wild fish. So that that reproductive um, loss is no longer there for those fish. Uh, maybe someone else wants to jump in, and I'm totally on the wrong train here, but. Well, I'm hoping that they aren't thinking about the last talk where there was a, when you put hatchery fish in with wild fish, there was sort of a, a crowd protection. And like, uh, uh, this... they, uh, yeah, that sort of thing. Right. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And gotcha. Eric, it's, it's like you read the second part of that question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, I totally misunderstood. Apologies, but yeah. 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 Would sterile hatchery steelhead not reduce the risk to, to the wild ones? And I think Eric just answered that. Well, well, you know, I hadn't even thought about that when I answered the. the that's, the that's what I mean. You, you got it. <laughs> that, that, that is kind of interesting. That you uh, it, yeah, yeah. What you do is you just rear a whole pile of hatchery steelhead smolts that are all <laughs> sterile and they're not going to come back and they're the fodder for the seals on the way down right. uh, sacrificial <laughs> oh yeah you have i'm to do uh, an adaptive management on that one yeah, <laughs> i'm uh I, I was past president of spruce city wildlife up here in prince george and we've got the the largest volunteer run uh conservation hatchery for chinook and we we released tens of thousands a fry every year and a few years ago we were at the boat launch here on the Nachaco River and we get the kids involved and every kid gets a, a little fry and they get to release it <laughs> and we had one of our local MLAs there and she was doing uh the, she had the camera out for for Facebook and she literally goes like this and she dumps it in <laughs> and a bull trout right in front of the boat <laughs> hammered it and she she looks at me she goes Steve is that supposed to happen I'm like <laughs> what, what do you say right it's it's uh, the reason the reason you put so many in there is because you know that that's a natural part of what's yeah. going to happen so well you know, Aaron Aaron on our team likes to say that uh what fish do is die so <laughs> yeah yeah those uh those those fish wheels that you spin and you got one out of a thousand little things that they they live it's quite depressing when you see the kids like <laughs> But again, so <laughs> uh, another good one from Rick Taylor is what is the next step in the modeling exercise and how might it be used by decision makers? Well, I can talk about next steps. Um, so far, to my knowledge, maybe someone else on the team has inside info, but we don't, uh, I'm not aware of anyone who's looking to um, pick up and run with this model who's in any kind of decision-making capacity. But um, in terms of what's next, I think one of the major issues that we're recognizing is the lack of the resident population. So especially as the results came out, we start to realize the importance of that return rate. 
uh, certainly residency is going to become more and more important as the marine conditions uh, get worse. So that's one next step. Um, I would say in terms of where we go from here in terms of putting it into something that's practicable, uh, I think we really, again, need details on what types of programs might be available, right? We can kind of hone in the realism, trying to do perhaps some additional data fitting if more data become available for things like small to adult return rate. Um, we're aware of some parameters that are just not as well informed as others. So certainly we would like to pursue more information and more information going into the model based off of those. Um, but yeah, in terms of where this is going in terms of actual decision making, I, I don't think that uh, I, I'm not in those conversations, at least. I don't know if Murdoch or Eric want to take a stab at it, but uh, I, I'll, I'll, we did I'll this tell for you. For you. Uh, <laughs> part of the reason why we took this on, so we took on the Thompson because there's a real synergy with the Willamette work. Mm -hmm. So Marin is going to be doing the um, hatchery modeling on the Willamette. Yeah. So uh, if you want to stay in touch, that uh, yeah, they the the they've got five or six places where they're going to be introducing steelhead hatchery steelhead. Some of them domesticated hatchery steelhead. I mean, mm. sometimes they. Well, I know it's really the Chinook that are domesticated. They've been in the hatchery for forty years. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, so it's going, and we're designing. Uh, Murdoch is a key part in that designing the adaptive management program to evaluate essentially this model. And mm -hmm. we're going to be using this model uh, to do, uh, maybe you could just, Marin, just think about <clears throat> the Willamette, but that, yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. In a different system, yes. <laughs> yeah, in a different system, we're using the same model. Yeah, I, I might've got my audio back now. I'm not sure. You do. Uh, okay. You sound great. Surprise, sir. Okay. Um, well, uh, Marin has actually developed this model in a much more sophisticated way for Chinook salmon in the Willamette, and that uh, this is a very simple model. It it uh, just has only one life history type, and we know that uh, there are different ages, uh, uh, you know, in terms of smolting and different ages at maturation and so on. And, and so there are several different life history types at once. And on top of that, this model does not have, uh, let's say, Celts, as far as I know, uh, whereas, no. uh, okay, um, Aaron has actually developed a population dynamics model for steelhead um, for the Willamette, which does have Celts in multiple life, well, actually still only one life history, but it, it's going to be going to several. It has, actually has different life histories and it has different ages at maturation and different has also has, uh, sort of survival to spawn again. And that could be a really important co uh, contribution when marine survival rate is really low, as we mm -hmm. have here. And, and so um, this model is... Uh, needs further development it's 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 just a uh, like a fairly simple model which uh, has plausible results but uh, we we would like to develop it into a model that is uh, more true to the uh, multiple life history types uh, the fact that they can they're in or paris this mm -hmm. version you know assumes that there's a uh, similar paris and so on and, and so right, yeah. it has quite a bit of development yet to go before it could even be uh, be thought about as uh, something you might want to present for decision makers Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So if MOE, BC MOE wants to do something, then, you know, we're working on the Willamette and uh, we, you know, Marin or somebody like, you know, Marin and Murdoch, I think would be happy to do analysis if uh, the MOE wanted it done, but we're not going to initiate it. <laughs> We did this like almost like a pro bono. We weren't uh, modeling was not part of the contract. We just thought this would be fun and interesting to do. Um, and, and so uh, on top of the literature review, you got some uh, a model developed for application to Thompson, but in a fairly simple way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. but it it actually helps us uh, in terms of our thinking for the Willamette. Uh, so you know, uh, we're we're covered by uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and so this is like don't tell them, but you know, this is actually one of the little mini side projects that we got involved with uh, because we're so nicely covered by them. All right, and we'll make this the last question because we're gonna put a hard stop on in just a couple of minutes.
So this one's from Brian, and he says, I have to disagree with Marin on the conservation hatchery versus uh, production hatchery. A conservation hatchery could be radically different in rearing single families, and marking would be done by family. Um, okay. If that is part of the... Uh, if that is a critical part of the plan, then yes, you can do that. Uh, you know, like, again, let's refer to the Willamette. They're doing pedigreed analysis. So every Chinook that goes up above the dam gets his pedigree. They know which fish are coming down, who their parents were, how mm -hmm. successful the parents were, all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, if you got the money, uh, <laughs> you can do a lot with uh, genetics these days. Um, uh, the, the stuff from Willamette is just really interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You, you're you probably more familiar with that than I am, Marin, But uh, Yeah, I guess I, I'm intrigued by this part of the question of rearing, rearing within uh, family. I wonder if you would introduce some issues with long-term genetics from inbreeding, but I'm assuming that I'm not understanding exactly what it is. Uh, specifically that you're suggesting in terms of the breeding program. Um, but yeah, certainly uh, with additional technological tools like pedigree analysis and genotyping, um, these things are certainly possible. And it's even been suggested that perhaps uh, all fish could be genotyped to try to identify the signature that tells you whether the fish is domesticated or not. Um, obviously, at this point, we're talking about a very expensive program, but uh, yeah, as Eric says, it's certainly possible. And, and the Willamette is a great example of a well-funded uh, program with a lot of research behind it. So, so yeah, I, uh, you know, things like, for instance, with genetics, you can follow the progeny of the progeny. Yeah. So uh, it's, and they're doing that in the Willamette. Yeah, yeah, and they're able to separate it by sex, they're able to separate it by how many generations of hatchery, uh, or how many generations since you had a hatchery parent, right? You, you yeah. can get quite yeah. advanced with these things. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers everybody's questions. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to leave a lot of them on deck, simply based on time. Uh, this was, educational, informative, and everything I kind of expected this chat to be, uh, like I said, I, I'm intimately involved with the, the, the Chinook hatchery up here for the last eight years, nine years, and it's uh, it, steelhead looking at it from a, a, a different point of view. Like uh, when, when he mentioned the family spawning, that's new to us because we do the matrix up here. And mm. uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of cool to see the different approaches and viewpoints from everybody, and I really appreciate everybody staying on topic. And I, I appreciate all your time, everybody that's uh, presented for these these two webinars. So yeah, thanks for the good questions, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's good thought provoking. Absolutely, effective. absolutely great. If you've got any more questions, feel free to reach out to us at the BC Wildlife Federation, and we can get you in touch with the right people. And uh, we'll go from there. So with that, everybody, have a great night. And we'll see you again. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.